A warning to listeners, this episode contains explicit language and descriptions of sexual violence. I'm Amy Britton, and this is Canary, an investigative podcast from The Washington Post. Chapter 2. A Secret That She Couldn't Tell It's not unusual to get tips or emails after publishing a story. I've gotten a lot of these tips after writing about sexual misconduct, and I usually follow up. When Carol Griffin first reached out to me, Hi, Amy. My name is Carol. She said she had information implicating someone named in the story about Lauren Clark, the young woman who was sexually assaulted and then handed out flyers that identified her attacker. Maybe pertinent to your recent article. I kept rereading Carol's email and wondering, who is this woman? Inspiration for my reaching out to you. I did some quick Googling, and I saw that a woman named Carol Griffin owned a bakery in Alabama. But if that was the same Carol Griffin who emailed me, how could she possibly be connected to Lauren Clark, the hairstylist in D.C.? I called Carol the very next day. She sounded anxious, unsettled, uneasy. I remember saying to her, If you don't want to talk about this, we don't have to talk about this. What she told me on that call was sensitive. Carol alleged that Judge Truman Morrison had sexually assaulted her when she was a teenage girl. And she said the assault marked just the beginning of his inappropriate sexual behavior toward her. Judge Truman Morrison. The judge from Lauren's story. One of the longest-serving judges on the Superior Court of the District of Columbia. The judge who gave the chef, Jairo Cruz, a 10-day jail sentence for sexually assaulting multiple women. Carol wasn't sure yet if she wanted to come forward with this allegation. Because of that, I told her I would keep the details of our call private. A few weeks went by, and eventually, Carol decided that she might be willing to share this information publicly. A lot of reporting leads are complete dead ends. Tips don't pan out, sources change their minds, people aren't who they say they are. But this story involves someone in a tremendous position of power. And it changed everything I thought I knew about Lauren's story. To get to the bottom of this, first I had to verify that Carol was who she said she was. That she was actually a baker from Alabama who knew Judge Truman Morrison. Then I needed to hear from her, on the record, the full details of her allegation against Judge Morrison. Neither of us were really sure what it would lead to, but Carol and I decided that the first step was meeting in person. So I flew to Birmingham, Alabama to meet with Carol. Good morning, welcome aboard American Eagle Flight 5528 with service to Birmingham. And when I got to Alabama, I met someone who was, as the locals say, Birmingham famous. It's like you're hiring a, hiring a night baker. This is a bakery. I met Carol at her workplace, a charming little bakery and French restaurant. We were there with her partner, Shay Reeves, who helps manage the place. This is sort of like the little oasis. When you walk inside the bakery, there are glass cases that are full of pastries, desserts, any type of carb that you could possibly want, they've got it. We'll never do anything that we don't absolutely love. Oh, I like the Alabama cookies. Yeah. Um, okay, let's go look in the kitchen. You yeah, 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 sure. Carol Griffin is 60 years old. She's petite, about five foot three, and she calls the shots. So this, this is right in the middle of service. It was a big operation. Carol told me that she had over 50 employees. That's Bianca. Hi. This is Gina. But that's Ryan and this, this is Darius. Hi, how are you? Mm-hmm. I call him king of the kitchen. He's been here. How long have you been here, Darius? Uh, almost nine years. Later that day, I drove to Carol and Shay's house on the outskirts of town. And we settled in for a late night of dinner and conversation. I saw that they had a piano in the corner of their living room. And as I was about to find out, 
music was a huge part of Carol's life. She had played the guitar since she was a kid. In the early 90s, Carol was a singer in this glam rock band called the Sugar Lalas. The way that she described it, they were pretty big in Alabama and they toured across the South. Do you feel like you were on the brink of potential fame? Oh my God, we got signed. They had a record deal. We got signed by the, the woman who signed Uncle Tupelo at the time, but it became Sunvolt. You know that band? It I became don't. Wilco. Wilco. But I'm not really a... Jay Farrar and... Uh, We'd spent hours talking about the bakery, talking about our music career. But the reason I was really here was hanging over all of us. Now I knew it was time to have a tough conversation about her allegations against Truman Morrison. I asked Carol to back up in time to start from the beginning. I needed to know how she knew Judge Morrison. Carol said that she first met Truman Morrison way before he was a judge. This was back in the early 1970s. At the time, he was just Truman, a close friend of Carol's family. Back then, they called him Tim. Carol said that Truman was first introduced to the family through his sister, Melanie. She had ties to the Birmingham area, and she was friends with the Griffins, going back to the 60s. Truman was a young lawyer moving up in the public defender's office in D.C. And from what Carol told me, her parents, Janet and Jean Griffin, had a lot in common with Truman. He was a couple of years younger than them. They were all really passionate about the civil rights movement and cared a lot about voter rights issues. Carol vividly remembers meeting Truman for the first time. The first time I met him was when we went to D.C. She said she was on a middle school field trip to Washington, D.C., where Truman lived. 73 was when I went with my mom. Her mother chaperoned the trip, and Carol said that they made plans to meet up with Truman and his first wife, Margaret. I remember us going out. He said, do you want to go for for a motorcycle ride. And I was like, can I, Mom? At the time, Truman was 29, and Carol was 13. And I got on the back of a freaking motorcycle. And I, you know, I mean, I was holding on to the back of him. But that felt kind of weird because I felt so special. She showed me a photo from that trip. And in the photo, she's standing with a middle school classmate and Truman and his first wife. The Washington Monument is in the background. Oh, my Lord, do you see all those those things right there? Those are Carol had a lot of photos, old journals, and some letters from that time in her life. Was this within this journal? Yes. Okay, so... The next photo she showed me was also with Truman. But this time the photo was in Birmingham. Carol said she thinks this photo was taken in 1974, when she was 14. There's a weird picture right there. She's sitting on top of Truman's shoulders with her arms around his neck and her feet are just kind of dangling down. Every picture that I see of him where I'm in a picture and he's in the picture, he's right next to me. He was always affectionate with me. Everything that Carol showed me so far proved that she knew Truman and she knew him well. Then she showed me something else. A letter she unearthed from 1975, from about 45 years ago. July 11th, 1975. Mr. Joe L. Jackson, director, Indian Springs School, Helena, Alabama, 35080. When Carol was 15 and in high school, Truman wrote her this glowing letter of recommendation. Carol was trying to get into a competitive private school in Alabama. I write in response to your letter of July 3rd, 1975, regarding the application of Ms. Carol Jean Griffin. Giving you my frank assessment of Carol Griffin is an easy task. Carol is simply one of the most unusual young women I have ever met. My family is very close to Carol's family, and as a consequence, I have spent a fair amount of time with Carol in the past few years. 
Sorry. Carol Griffin is intelligent, articulate, attractive, and personable. She is possessed of a maturity and sense of responsibility and judgment which few people her age possess. Sincerely, Truman A. Morrison III, Esquire, Chief Felony Trial Division. Well, Carol read this to me from two old yellowing pieces of paper. Truman had attached a typewritten cover letter to it, addressed to Carol's family. He wrote, Dear Griffins, Enclosed, please find a copy of the letter that I wrote to Mr. Jackson of the Indian Springs Schools. Whatever the hell that is. The public schools ain't good enough for you, eh, Carol? It's that neighborhood you folks been living in, I guess. He signed the letter, We miss you and love you all. Truman and Margaret. Margaret, his first wife. At the bottom, he wrote in red ink, P.S. I am taking guitar lessons, so watch out, Carol. Oh, it just makes me so sad. Why does it make you sad? This is the person that I knew and trusted. Now I had a better understanding of how Carol and Truman had grown to know each other and how close Truman was with the family. It seemed like important background to understand what happened next. Carol was about to tell me, on the record, what she said that Truman Morrison had done to her. About a year after that high school letter of recommendation, Carol's family and Truman's family made plans to take a vacation together. Carol was 16 and a junior in high school. She was traveling with her parents and her younger brother and younger sister. From what Carol told me, Truman was 32 and a lawyer working in the D.C. Public Defender's Office. Carol said he was traveling with his wife. The Griffins and the Morrisons and their extended families were going to meet in a farmhouse in Virginia. This house was about halfway between Birmingham and D.C., right outside of a small town called Marion. I remember there was, it was a very perilous sort of drive-in. The property belonged to the Morrison family. It was a two-story house, I remember. I remember being just blown away when we went in because it was so beautiful. It was a big gathering. During the day, the family spent some of their time swimming at a local lake. And Carol said that Truman spent a lot of time with her. I would swim back and forth with him back and forth and he did a breaststroke so I learned to do the breaststroke I remember my cousins saying something to me like ooh Carol she's so grown up she does she does this hang out with the grown ups you know she's too good to hang out with us or whatever mm-hmm. and I just kind of was like a oh, quit being so immature <laughs> Carol said her mother made the same point and this point would stick with her the way her mother said it the tone that Carol said that she used Carol described it as scolding. She said, you don't need to be hanging out with the adults. You need to be hanging out with your cousins. But I think what she probably was thinking, I don't need to be freaking hanging out with a grown man. There were a lot of people on vacation with them, and it was crowded inside this farmhouse. Carol remembers that one night, instead of sleeping inside the farmhouse, people went up to a deck and fell asleep there. As Carol described it, this deck was a low wooden platform on top of a hill like behind the barn or whatever. Was the the deck uh, open or was it enclosed? It was open. It was open. It was just like a platform. She remembers falling asleep, cuddled up next to her mom. Truman Morrison was on the other side of Carol. Carol is about to give a detailed description of a sexual assault. You'll hear her call Truman Morrison Tim, his nickname at the time. And then the next thing I know... Uh, I woke to something like, you know how when you're really in a deep sleep and somebody is talking to you or whatever, but you kind of come out of a deep place and you realize you're trying to put together what's happening. I could hear somebody whispering my name 
and it was like Carol, Carol, like that, like real insistent, but really super quiet and super directed right toward my face. And I finally I opened up. I was like, what? And then I realized it was Tim, and he was mad. And um, and then that's when I remember some kind of I had an awareness of my uh, my I I just sort of remember I thought it was like a breeze or something or a coolness on my on you know below my waist and. Um, And then I just remember, you know, I don't know, do you want me to tell you what happened? Um, I remember n realizing that he had his hand in my pants and in my vagina. I mean, I'm saying this all happened really quick. I'm trying to describe every sensation, but I remember hearing my name really insistently. I remember thinking he's mad. Then I remember thinking he's that he's got his hand in my pants. I guess he pulled his hand out of my thing at my pants and took my hand and put it on his pants and that's what I was saying I I kind of expected there to be something recognizable there like a penis or little rotty thing you know like a like I said a hot dog or something but it really didn't have any shape to it or form and that I could recognize and then uh, it was just soft and kind of mushy and uh, and then I had that just kind of realization that it was wet as I was trying to figure out what was going on and then I put it all together that he had ejaculated. Do you remember saying anything to him? No. Oh my God, because my mother or whoever, there were people up there, that was Margaret was on the other side of him. I mean, no, and that was just obvious the way he was going, Carol. It was like, it was very, he, he was taking a big chance to say that, you know, just to fucking wake me up. He had obviously been trying to wake me up. And then that's all I remember. It's like a blackout after that. I don't remember people waking up. I don't remember anything that happened after that. I remember zero. I mean, I'm just, that's the first time I'm thinking, because I would tell you more, but that's all, that's, it's just like the, somebody cut the reel right there. And I don't remember anything else. Carol's account was all on the record. It was a specific, detailed allegation of a sexual assault from more than 40 years ago. She had been 16 years old, a high school junior. Truman was 32, a lawyer. It was a few years before he became Judge Truman Morrison. Carol told me that he had penetrated her vagina with his fingers while she was sleeping without her consent. After this first sit-down interview with Carol... I learned that she had a lot more to tell me. She told me about the other incidents of abuse she said came at the hands of Truman Morrison. But for now, we're going to follow this reporting as it unfolded. I think that's probably a good place to stop. Yeah. A little heavy. Yeah. Yeah. You okay? Yeah. I am. Thanks yeah. for asking. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm surprised that just like, no, oh, it's just like I get so mad and then, but I get so sad. Mm -hmm. And yeah, let me stop it. Okay. okay. <laughs> Carol. 
I've been reporting on sexual assault and harassment cases for a while now, both unknown cases and high-profile ones. So let me bring in one of the Washington Post reporters who broke the story wide open. She is Amy Britton. Amy, welcome. Thank you for having me. So Charlie Rose has been fired. And one of the things that is always frustrating is that it's impossible to know how common these experiences are. The reason, according to experts, is because the vast majority of sexual assaults in the United States go unreported to law enforcement. So if someone doesn't report something, how can you count it? How can you figure out the scope of the problem? A government agency, the Bureau of Justice Statistics, offers an estimate. Every year, they do a survey to try to find out how many Americans, ages 12 and over, have experienced a rape or sexual assault. From 2014 to 2018, the yearly average was estimated to be over 428,000 people. It's a hard number to wrap your head around. Nearly half a million people each year. But what all of that means is that there are likely millions of people, men and women, in the United States who have experienced a sexual assault in their lifetime. Most of these accounts never end up in a national newspaper. But the ones that do, like Carol's or Lauren's, can help shed light on the systems that make these abuses possible. And even though I've spoken to many people who have come forward The way Carol's journey was unfolding was rare for me as a reporter. Carol was willing to have all of this reporting process recorded. The messy parts, moments of anger, and feelings of uncertainty. She thought there might be value to someone somewhere going through the same struggles to show what it's like to come forward as a victim of sexual assault. Carol had been living with this secret for more than 40 years. But taking her account public and bracing for the fallout and the judgment, that was all unknown territory. I can tell you, as a reporter who has covered this topic before, these are hard stories. They require a high level of sensitivity, and before these stories can ever be published, they have to go through a rigorous process of vetting. There's also the challenge of confronting people, typically men. You have to ask them to respond to allegations of improper behavior. It takes a lot of work to represent all the facts fairly and completely. And these stories can seriously affect the lives and careers of everyone involved. The accused can face permanent damage to their reputations or even legal consequences. And the people who come forward, they can be criticized and in some cases, even vilified. Carol was planning to publicly accuse a judge who had a lot to lose. On that first trip to Birmingham, she didn't really know what would happen next. She couldn't have. Neither could I. I talked to Shay, Carol's longtime partner, to get his perspective on Carol's decision to come forward and what this struggle had been like for her. You know, she had a secret that she couldn't tell, and I think that was damaging for her. She blamed herself, because I know that she has spent a lot of time going back and sort of replaying it, you know, and trying to figure out what she did. You know, kind of like, what did I do to make that happen? Do you think she can ever shake that? I think there will always be an element of that there somewhere. You know what I mean? There's 45 years of history that's not going to go away. But I think it is something that can, that she can learn to do differently. And in the middle of this reporting, Shay made an offhand remark to me. He just kind of said it in passing. But it stuck with me. It was about Carol. But it also made me think of Lauren, the D.C. jogger who had spoken out about her sexual assault, the woman whose story had prompted Carol to reach out to me in the first place. It's like almost with Carol, there's just, there's a, there's a part that refused to be silenced, that refused to be ignored. And that kind of reminds me of a canary in the coal mine, like the canary in the coal mine is 
something that's very fragile that dies first and it dying lets you know that there's trouble coming mm-hmm. so I don't they know. don't always die though the canaries don't yeah apparently they resuscitate them when they get to oh, really? the surface yeah okay i didn't know that a canary in a coal mine you've probably heard this phrase before A century ago, in coal mines, the biggest threat to miners was a toxic, odorless gas, carbon monoxide. But there was a way to warn these miners. Mining companies either bred or bought canaries from pet stores. They usually bought the female canaries because they were cheaper. When a canary sensed that something was wrong in the mine, it would flap its wings, and then it would fall unconscious on the bottom of the cage. The danger was all around those miners, but they couldn't have known it. Not until that little bird alerted them. The canary in the coal mine. Carol had been stuck, frozen, for decades. Now she was starting to tell her story. She was preparing to speak of the danger she said she had faced. And she had only come to this point, over 40 years later, because another woman... Lauren Clark had raised the alarm. In the next chapter of Canary. We were in kind of a couple's counseling together, and and that was a frequent topic. What's the son bitch's name? Well, can you describe him in general? What did she tell you about him? Uh, Basically, she told me that he was a judge. But I will not show